Okay, so <clears throat> here we go. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to, <clears throat> to this uh, great event. It's a pleasure to, to be here. So uh, <clears throat> looking back at, uh, at some of the, say, major milestones of, of AI, uh, Deep Blue, for example, beating Gary Kasparov in, in chess, Watson winning the Jeopardy, a game or uh, more recently alpha go uh, beating the best go players the best human go players worldwide uh, there are maybe a few notable things to remark one is that uh, apparently ai researchers like games a lot uh, like games a lot and, and this is perfectly true and for very good reason and the second thing is that uh, the methodology that was on the basis of these successes has uh, changed uh, quite a lot in the course of time. So, um, for example, in the case of, of, of chess, it was basically at that time clever algorithmic ideas, um, game tree search uh, combined with really massive computer power parallel computing uh, and so on. Then in the case of Jeopardy, it was more uh, information retrieval that was uh, enabling technology uh, combined with uh, natural language processing. And then more recently, the um, <clears throat> success of Go, of AlphaGo was really a breakthrough made possible by machine learning technology, uh, especially deep learning methods, but combined also with other machine learning approaches, supervised learning, reinforcement learning, uh, Monte Carlo tree search, uh, and so on. So uh, we see a clear development here from algorithmic over more knowledge base towards now more data-driven approaches enabled by uh, machine learning approaches. <clears throat> and of course, AI, meanwhile, has made the transition from the world of games, uh, so to say, into the real world and uh, is now applied also successfully to real world problems, yeah, to quite a broad range of, of different types of real world problems. <clears throat> And if you look at these problems, then many of them are really complex. Uh, in many cases, the uh, desired input-output behavior that is supposed to be realized by an AI system is very complex in the sense that very often a high dimensional feature vector, for example, describing the current environment of an AI agent uh, is supposed to be mapped to an appropriate action to be taken, often very quickly, uh, sometimes perhaps even under real-time conditions. Uh, this is the case, for instance, in autonomous driving, but also in many robotics applications, industry, uh, precision medicine, uh, and so on. And uh, <clears throat> these are applications, the complexity of which prevents, so to say, the classical way of solving problems in computer science, these problems are simply no longer amenable to the, say, classical algorithmic approach to problem solving, unlike simpler problems that can be specified very precisely, clearly, like, I don't know, finding the uh, shortest path in a graph where uh, the computer scientist has a chance to clearly understand the problem and not only the problem, but also the way how to solve the problem. So to tackle these type of problems algorithmically and using a standard programming uh, approaches, the computer scientist does not only need to understand the problem, but also uh, the way how to solve the problem step by step. So the computer scientist comes up with a clever algorithmic idea and then implements it. Yeah, that is the classical way of algorithmic problem solving in computer science. And that, of course, doesn't work anymore for this complex type of problems. 
So one important step in the evolution of intelligent systems design, which is the main topic of my presentation today, was the uh, invention of the good old expert systems yeah, or knowledge-based systems, where, um, where a key idea a key idea was to uh, somehow separate the uh, representation of knowledge from the processing of the knowledge, from, from the inference, yeah? And uh, thereby also the role of uh, what is typically called the human expert on the one side and the computer scientist uh, on, on the other side. The expert was only, so to say, responsible for specifying the domain knowledge and roughly speaking, mm, explaining what is the problem about, so what ought to be solved, but not necessarily how to do that. Yeah. <clears throat> the how was somehow con con contained here in this inference engine, which is of a more generic uh, type, yeah, implemented on the basis of uh, generic control structures, programs essentially uh, formalized in terms of theories of formal logic, closely related to the idea of uh, declarative programming, uh, for example, and so on. So that was a, an important step forward. And at that time, uh, these expert systems have been quite successful in some applications, but still, in many other cases, uh, this approach uh, still suffered from what is sometimes called the knowledge acquisition bottleneck. So uh, the problem that in many cases, experts are either not able or not willing uh, to make their domain knowledge explicit and to formalize it in an appropriate manner. So to make it amenable to automated knowledge uh, processing, which is needed to realize this uh, kind of of approach. So still uh, a problem here. And it's also true, one has to realize that uh, <clears throat> there are many uh, examples of human skills, which we perhaps would like to automate, but which are really not easy uh, to describe in an explicit way. There are many things that we as humans can do very well but we do not really know how to explain how we do that. Yeah, pattern recognition is one such example. You look at an image and within a fraction of a second, you can say uh, whether that is a man, for example, shown on the image or whether it's, it's a woman. But, but how exactly do you do that? How can you explain how you do it? And can you uh, implement a computer program taking an image uh, on actually not an image you can look at, but a high dimensional um, feature vector, uh, a bitmap uh, describing an image as an input and then uh, producing the right output. That is extremely difficult to do. And there are many other examples, for example, uh, translation of text yeah, from English to German. We can do that uh, quite easily. Well, <laughs> many of us can, can do that uh, quite easily, but explaining and automating it is, is very difficult. Uh, let alone automatic text summarization, for example. Yeah, you read a paper and then you write an abstract, uh, which is again uh, something we can do, but which uh, is very hard to describe how you do it and uh, how you could perhaps automate it so that an AI system can do the same job. So in all these examples, in principle, it would be... Uh, instead of developing a solution directly, so either traditional algorithmic approach or following a knowledge-based approach, it would be much easier to, for example, show examples and let the system generalize, hoping that after the system has seen a couple of examples labeled with, this is a male, uh, this is a female, and so on, at some point the system will be able uh, to categorize new images correctly by itself, or uh, to let the system uh, try out things, uh, football playing robot, for example, and provide feedback. Yeah, that was 
a good action that was a less good action in that situation, et cetera, hoping that uh, the AI system, the robot will improve in the course of time or to demonstrate a certain behavior like driving a car, um, uh, letting the, 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 the computer yeah, watch what you are doing uh, and then hoping that the AI system will be able to imitate your behavior. These are all examples of different types of machine learning this year falls into the uh, category of what we call supervised learning. This in the middle is a typical example of reinforcement learning. And this year on the right is an example of uh, what, what we call imitation learning. Uh, and this is a key idea, uh, which uh, was made uh, quite nicely in this quote here by Andrew Eng a couple of years ago who said that uh, machine learning is the science of getting computers to act without being explicitly programmed. Yeah? So this is a key idea. You, you, you um, program, so to say, you, you realize a program or an AI system with a certain input-output behavior in an implicit way through learning. Yeah? So the machine learning algorithm so to say is taking the job here of uh, the computer scientist um, uh, or data scientist, we would perhaps say today, and the machine learning algorithm, of course, must be fed with data. Yeah, this is what it needs. And in this data, this is the idea, uh, the domain knowledge is somehow contained at least uh, in an implicit way. Um, and just as a side remark, perhaps um, learning from data in this way, at least in principle, also allows to reach superhuman performance to even outperform uh, the human expert in principle. Yeah, this is possible if uh, important knowledge is contained in the data, although it could not be leveraged by the human expert herself. Uh, this is not actually not or very difficult uh, to uh, achieve for this classical expert systems approach because then if the expert herself uh, specifies the knowledge in principle the best you can hope for is to reach uh, the expert level but not to really go beyond AlphaGo, by the way <clears throat> is again a, a good example of, of this type uh, where the human eventually could be outperformed uh, for example, by letting the system permanently play against itself, et cetera, and generating new data in that way. However, in many uh, practical applications, and one could even somehow say this is in general true, data alone is not enough because data alone does not have meaning. Uh, data becomes meaningful only when being interpreted against the background of at least some sort of, of background knowledge, which must also be incorporated in the learning process. So learning does not just mean turning data into uh, knowledge or turning data into predictive models. Uh, typically, you need more uh, to learn in a successful way. You need the data, sure, but you also need some sort of prior knowledge. Uh, that must be incorporated because, for example, data can be generalized in various ways. And to successfully generalize beyond uh, the training data so that you end up with a predictive model that performs well on new unseen uh, cases in new situations, uh, you need a proper prior knowledge. Um, and the less data you have to train, the more of this prior knowledge you typically uh, need. Besides, um, a proper induction principle is needed uh, to, to realize this generalization uh, process, a proper formalization of uh, the machine learning problem. And then, of course, the whole uh, thing needs to be realized and implemented in an algorithmic way. So. Uh, from the point of view of the computer scientist, um, the situation is such that an algorithm is no longer needed now for the original problem. Uh, for the original problem, the input output behavior 
of the system you want to realize, but for the problem to learn how to solve the problem. So what is needed here is a learning algorithm. And I put it in this box to make it clear that this is once again an algorithm. Yeah, the learner, what is called the learner here, this is again an algorithm uh, which uh, accepts certain inputs, the prior knowledge, the data, et cetera, and produces an output. And the output in this case is exactly the type of model you would like to realize the type of model you need uh, for your concrete application. And this once again is of course not an easy task. Yeah, uh, This is a task that somebody has to accomplish, a computer scientist or a data scientist, however you want to call, uh, to call that person. And indeed, if you look inside uh, computer, uh, inside machine learning algorithms, typically these algorithms uh, do have a quite complex uh, structure. They often comprise many components that are combined in a, a complex way to form something we often call a machine learning pipeline. So here you see such a machine learning pipeline consisting of various components combined with each other in this particular example, it's a pipeline for the purpose of image processing. And moreover, <clears throat> each of these components or um, every machine learning algorithm in general typically has a number of parameters you can play with. These parameters, to distinguish them from the parameters of the models that are learned by the uh, algorithm are often called hyperparameters. And um, yeah, for a, for, for, for a deep neural network, for example, convolutional neural network, you easily come up with, uh, I don't know, 40 or so hyperparameters you can play with. And these hyperparameters often have an important influence on the performance, you know, on how successful the learning is. So uh, you, you need some experience to come up with a good configuration of uh, machine learning algorithms. And uh, the practical solution of a machine learning problem uh, one can say comes along with uh, an explicit, explicit or implicit determination of thousands of degrees of freedom. Yeah, and to do that in a in a in a good way, uh, as I said, you you need some experience and you need some good uh, background knowledge in uh, the field of machine learning. So this data driven approach to problem solving also requires a relatively high degree of machine learning expertise which is often not available. Yeah? In industry, for example, uh, this expertise is often not available. And this has uh, motivated this uh, more recent uh, research trend on automated machine learning. Um, so the idea of automating this whole process of developing machine learning solutions, of designing good machine learning pipelines that can do successful uh, learning. So by AutoML, uh, we mean the automatic, uh, the, autom the automatic selection and parameterization of machine learning algorithms, as well as the composition of these algorithms into such a machine learning pipeline, which is specifically optimized for a concrete application at hand. Uh, and this comes with a number of challenges. So for example, often these algorithms do have a recursive uh, structure. If you decide to use one algorithm, uh, this algorithm may need to call certain other algorithms as subroutines, etc. There are strong dependency between the algorithms. So uh, you cannot just configure any pipeline. You have to be very careful which algorithms to combine with each other. Every algorithm has specific parameters yeah, uh, that uh, need to be set. Also, <clears throat> the evaluation of uh, such machine learning pipelines, yeah, when you search for a good pipeline, in one way or the other, you have to try out uh, certain candidates. Uh, this evaluation is expensive because it eventually means that you have to uh, train the uh, corresponding pipeline to run it on a given data set and to evaluate uh, the model that has been learned on a corresponding test data set. So this is sometimes quite time consuming. For example, if you train deep neural networks, uh, this uh, requires time and resources. 
Yes, and the search space, so the space of possible candidate pipelines is normally huge. Yeah, this is a huge uh, search space that an auto ML uh, method is explicitly or implicitly searching. So uh, to summarize, um, when you have to solve a problem, how can you do that? Uh, if you want to develop an AI system, one way is to uh, do it in the say classical way to develop an algorithm and to implement it. And this means that you somehow have to instruct the computer how to solve uh, the concrete uh, problem, for example, pattern recognition. Yeah. Or you refer to the machine learning approach. In this case, uh, still an algorithm is needed, namely a machine learning algorithm. And uh, in one way or the other, the computer scientist has to instruct the computer how to learn how to solve the problem. Yeah. Um, this algorithm is fed with data and it produces as an output an algorithm, for example, a predictor that can then play the role uh, of uh, this algorithm here that in former years has been uh, developed by hand in an algorithmic way. Or you could go one step further and uh, do it uh, using automated machine learning approaches. In this case, you have to instruct the computer uh, how to find a good way to learn how to solve the problem. This is essentially what AutoML is doing. And uh, the, uh, the output then is a machine learning algorithm, a pipeline, which uh, you can plug in here uh, and then use to produce an algorithm for the original problem. So the thing you actually need here. And something I did not uh, address in detail, but you can even go one step further and do something that is often called meta learning, learning on a meta level. In this case, you have to instruct the computer how to learn, how to learn, how to solve the problem. Yeah, learning to learn. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, the output then of such a meta learning system is an auto ML algorithm. And then you can go all the way up here uh, to eventually produce again the uh, solution you would like to have. Yeah. So yeah, to sum up, um, maybe uh, three points. Uh, looking back at this way, so to say, in which uh, AI methodology, problem solving methodology in AI has developed uh, in the course of time, uh, we can see some trends, I, I would say. This is, of course, a simplified presentation I have given here in the sh short amount of time available. But nevertheless, I think it's fair to say that uh, data is becoming increasingly important. So uh, there is a trend from going from knowledge-based approaches more towards data-driven uh, problem-solving methods. Machine learning these days is quite a lot dominating the field. Knowledge remains important. Uh, however, it is getting more abstract. So it's no longer uh, the concrete domain knowledge that is often needed, but other types of knowledge. For example, knowledge about how to do good machine learning, yeah, which is in a sense a more abstract type of, of, uh, <clears throat> of expertise of knowledge. And also the algorithms themselves seem to become more generic. Yeah? Uh, from direct solutions to the problem you would like to tackle over uh, machine learning algorithms and automated machine learning al algorithms to uh, what I call meta learning. So this is my final slide. One can perhaps, once again, in a quite simplified form, of course, put these uh, approaches in such a diagram as, as shown here. Uh, on the one side, we see that things are getting more abstract, yeah, the level at which you solve problems, the domain knowledge, the data level, the, the metadata level, and on the other, in the other direction here, on the x-axis, we see that we have a higher degree of automation uh, of the problem solving process. Okay, with this final slide, I would thank you very much for your attention.